Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having frank and open conversations with thought leaders and practitioners in and around product management, hoping to use our combined experience to inspire you to be a better product manager, product leader, or just make better products. If that sounds like your sort of thing and you want more, well, you're in luck. I'd recommend heading over to onenightinproduct.com where you can sign up to the mailing list, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or follow the podcast on your favorite social media platform and guarantee you never miss another episode again. On tonight's episode, we zoom out and look at the world of product management, the plethora of content, frameworks and methodologies available and ask ourselves, which one do I choose? We talk about my guest's efforts to sort the wheat from the chaff and make it actionable, and some of his early successes getting traction with the product community. We also think about what to do when you're working in a less than ideal product culture, where some of these frameworks and methods might even meet a little bit of resistance, and what we might do to land our message properly with those who need persuading. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is George Nurejanian. George describes strategy and metrics as his love language, but we'll try to keep this interview suitable for all ages. George moved over to New Zealand from Russia and started out in a hazmat suit spraying chemicals onto timber before an untimely injury led him to seek a more relaxing career but unfortunately for him, he ended up in product management. George is currently working as a product owner at accounting platform Zero and founder of Product Management World, which hit number two on Product Hunt and hopes to help you map out your product challenges to the solution. Hi, right, George. How are you tonight? Great, thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you here. So first things first, you are a product owner at Zero, which I know to be an accounting platform. But in your words, what problem does that specifically solve? Zero is uh, uh, is a accounting software as a service, and it's grown to cover many aspects of doing the accounting, as well as just serving small businesses uh, with a bunch of tools. You know, there's a lot of requirements that businesses have to go through. They have to comply with a lot of laws, taxation, regulations, and etc. And obviously, it depends on which country the business is in. So that that changes quite drastically as well. So a whole bunch of problems to solve and zero solving it all (laughs) or at least trying to and they're doing pretty well so 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 far so good then yeah but that's interesting around the regulation and some of those related issues i mean that's the world that i'm working in right now as well and one big problem is that regulation is different as you say in most countries of the world or certainly regionally if you think of places like the eu and stuff like that I guess the question is then, are you working yourself on stuff that's really multinational and trying to cover stuff across all of those countries? Or are you focusing on certain areas, certain regions at the moment and expanding as you go and as you build that expertise in different markets? You know, my my role is really interesting, Uh, you know, because Zero is such a large company, it it has grown layers of, you know, product teams and different products. And then uh, also the platform that sits underneath it all and tries to power these product teams. So I'm actually on a on a platform team that is working on our design system, which is a very interesting place to be in, uh, in any company. You know, design systems are a fascinating area that I've been diving into in the past uh, sort of six months. The core aspect of a design system is that it tries to, you know, unite all the designers and engineers at a company to build coherent experiences uh, across the whole product. And you can imagine how big of a product that is. And certainly once you know, Zero purchases other products, they have to be integrated and make sure that they look the same. So there's a lot of work to do there. So that's my primary. So I'm quite far away from the tax regulations in uh, the UK and the US, which uh, <laughs> I'm quite uh, quite thankful for, because uh, I do think it's a, it's a, it, it, there's a lot of stuff there. But, um, you know, design systems also keep me busy. It's quite a complex space too. Yeah, I was going to say, so design systems and template libraries and component libraries and and things like that can be really transformational and make sure that you get everything on the same page and I completely agree that as you start to integrate other products as well that can be really important give you a unified experience but does that mean you have to be quite designer yourself like do you have to have quite a good design eye or are you leaving that to some of the designers and really concentrating on the fundamental product stuff of you know requirements and and solving problems yeah that's a great question Uh, yeah I mean we do have a an amazing team, uh, you know, many designers, principal designers, and you know, design managers who are definitely, you know, thinking deeply about the aspects of design. But I mean, it helps to be close to the aspects of you know user experience and design in general. 
I don't think that I have, you know, I, I don't have a formal education in that, but I have uh, always been interested in UX. I've worked on UX uh, projects, so it's close to me. But, you know, it, it is an interesting uh, field because, you know, design systems, it's not a product in a, you know, a more standard sense where you have, you put something, you launch something, you get people paying for it, and, uh, you know, there might be churn and whatnot. But there are very, there's quite a lot of similarities there because, you know, you do have to think about adoption, which is basically your sales process if you want to think about it, and maybe even retention uh, in a way that, that a SaaS product would think about. So it's all very familiar. You just have to kind of shift your lens a little bit in that space. So yeah, that, that's the majority of what product work means in that space. I'm sure you've got a mean uh, set of skills in Canva as well, so you can do the design as much as you want there too. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Canva, you know, I try to use Figma as much as possible as well. That's That's the tool of choice for many designers these days. So yeah, what I mean, you know, you have to use whatever tool you get get your hands on to do the job. That's usually how it is. Well, speaking of which, you list yourself on LinkedIn as Chief Hacker in Residence at Product Management World. Now, I know that that means that you're really the founder. <laughs> so what problem are you trying to solve with your side hustle, Product Management World? Yeah, Product Management World came together about a year ago. And it was really off the back of me realizing that in you know product land and you know there's there's a kind of a connective tissue there to marketing and even sales and you know indie hacking there's all these interconnected worlds that come together and uh, the fact that, uh, is that you know there are quite a lot of different approaches to building product uh, evolving product quite a lot of approaches to figuring out if it's valuable if it's feasible if it's going to make money but they're all kind of scattered all over the place and you know you pick it up from different blog posts or from different videos and you think, well, maybe I should try it this way or maybe I'll try, you know, this test here or this test there. And it's usually all very disconnected and but also you don't really know where to start and you don't really know what to try when. So I was trying to solve that problem by just connecting all these things together in a framework. And that framework, you know, it's not something that I've come up with. You know, obviously we hear Marty Kagan talk about, you know, feasibility and desirability and viability. And so those are some of the things that I wanted to first map all these techniques to because when we, we start talking about, you know, as a product person, you have to worry about, you know, making sure that the product uh, is needed by people and they can express that need by hopefully committing some some money towards that, you know, solving that need. What are the ways to get that out of them early on so that you don't build the whole product to find that out? So that was the whole thing about that tool is just, just try to connect all these different techniques and help product teams and everyone else find them quicker and structure their plans. Yeah, so that's interesting because, of course, everything that you said is is a constant pain point for a lot of product people around the world. You, know, it's not, you don't have to look too far to see people complaining about trying to work out how to validate things or how to test their hypotheses and, and so forth. But looking at the site, as I'm literally doing now, you've obviously got a lot of other people's frameworks on there like so you're linking out to a lot of these other best in class practices and you know, i'm sure marcy kagan's in there somewhere as well got things like uh bayesian analysis of market experiments van vestendorps and stuff like that so there's lots of really interesting content on there so do you see yourself as almost like the wikipedia of product or are you also layering some of your own stuff on top of that to kind of bring some kind of sense to the very disparate set of resources that you're bringing together yeah, I mean, you can think of it as uh, as Wikipedia. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely curating a lot of that content uh, as I find it, you know, and, and I try to use it as well uh, for my own personal products just to see whether that um, solution that that content provides actually works. So I try to validate it that, that way. When it comes to my uh, own personal sort of techniques in that space, I probably haven't, uh, I don't really find a need to come up with more because there's quite a lot of them <laughs> already. One of the reasons why I wanted to build this was to kind of turn the chaos of all these various frameworks flying around into a bit uh, a bit of a you know le- in a less messy state and that's what it was about i think really the main innovation uh, for, when that, within their product is the ability to sort of connect a technique that stands on its own to what risk it's really solving for what is it trying to achieve and maybe which stage it is in and perhaps whether it's a thing that's that's very actionable or maybe it's just a way to structure your thinking you know so i try to add kind of like a metadata to that world that was completely unstructured. 
Right, yeah, so I can go in as I, again, am now, and I can say, for example, that I'm looking to do some competitive research, and it gives me a couple of different approaches for that, ads history and impersonator, for example. And then you can also filter that by risk, and you can filter it by the stage as well. So it's, again, yeah, as you say, that metadata layer, which helps me as a as a user kind of surrounded by just everything to at least narrow down my options, right? That's right. But that's right. I guess I still have to choose, right? Yeah. And once I've chosen, is that kind of the end of the transaction with regards to your site? Like I just go somewhere else and, and read that and do that myself? Or is there any kind of onwards journey from there or any kind of follow on that I can do saying like that didn't work and this is why that didn't work. And maybe then you can use that to sort of tweak your algorithms or tweak your recommendations or whatever. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a huge roadmap that I have in mind for the product. You know, it's probably very early stages for that product at the moment. I'm trying to figure out how to, well, I'm actually using one of the techniques to, to validate whether uh, what I've put together is principally valuable uh, from the perspective of someone, you know, paying actual money for it. Yeah. Just because I know that there's a lot of traffic that goes to it, but as you were saying, you know, does it actually lead to any insight? Does it actually lead to a positive action that people are willing to pay for? And certainly there's there's a lot to do there because it's not just a matter of uh, finding the right content and going to it and doing it. You also have to validate whether that particular approach worked, whether you maybe, you know, chose something that you shouldn't have chosen first, maybe you should have chosen something else. There's a whole world there. Originally, it started actually as a, as a you know, there was a concierge type of test where yeah. I would offer people to kind of give me their conditions first, provide me with sort of the context of where they're, what they're trying to solve. And that would give them a bit of a more in-depth kind of strung together plan for what to do uh, in that space. At the time when I, when I launched it, it didn't really pan out exactly how I thought it would, which is, I guess, the whole purpose of doing these experiments. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, it, it worked in that sense, but it didn't really go that far. And people were kind of either just unresponsive or they would uh, say that, you know, there's there's more to it. And, and of course, there's always more to it because uh, unfortunately, these complicated situations cannot be just solved with an experiment here, an experiment there. It's usually just a starting point. But of course, you have to do your own thinking. You have to do your own work. That's, yeah, that's a given. Yeah. And is there any community aspect of this as well like where people can start to share war stories and hints and tips and maybe take some of that burden off of yourself or are you still very much curating that yourself for the time being and maybe doing that in the future at the moment yeah uh, the curation hasn't been uh you know a problem with in terms of trying to scale it because i mean there, there are probably some uh, more techniques and frameworks that are hiding from me <laughs> but it's it's thankfully it's not it's not, you know, they're not being produced at such a high rate that they're, they're uh, difficult to catch them. A community is always uh, has always been on my mind. You know, I, I've always thought of it as as uh, kind of the next step for this, just because part of it would be also to see how people implement these things in the wild and whether they run into issues or whether you know there are certain, for instance, you know, a lot of these tests they they actually are met with a bit of disdain from say the engineers or or uh, <laughs> other parts parts of the organization so you know there's a lot of things that are just organizational level that you have to figure out besides just thinking up of what experiment to run i'm specifically thinking of the 404 test because that's that's when uh, the engineers put up their hands and say hey this is going to be a terrible user experience we're going to send a person down uh, you know, to a 404 page you know it's terrible and of course it it is not ideal, but uh, it it serves a purpose. Yeah, and uh, yeah, part of getting it done is to un- get them understand uh, why it needs to be done. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and I think a lot of these techniques, which you might expect for, for example, like maybe a more early stage startup or something like that, or like when you're still a sold founder or whatever, and and you can kind of just do what you want, and then sometimes they tend to collide with say beta e companies that are sitting there serving like big banks or you know, other big companies because ultimately then there's this kind of paranoia that everything has to be perfect for people otherwise people are going to start to get cross and they're spending a lot of money with you so it's just yeah i completely understand where you're coming from and we've all had those discussions with engineers and, and stakeholders as well but what gave you the idea in the first place that you needed to start this up like what sparked that off in you and, and got you started along that path I think for me, uh, you know, there's a wonderful book by David Bland that came out a couple of months, I think, before that ca- that idea came to mind. And he actually started to do a lot of this uh, stuff in that book. You know, he started to put this together 
and he started to kind of think of how different tests are necessary for uh, for different reasons and for different needs. But unfortunately, you know, in the format of a book, it's not really handy because you read it on a page. You can't really filter out uh, out of even forty items in that uh, in that list. And I certainly had more on my mind, so that's where I thought that well, at least I can make this a little bit better and turn it into something a bit more interactive. And then part of it was, you know, there's a couple of things happening at the same time. You know, I wanted to try out a couple of no code tools, which you know I built that product in, and so it all came together. And then putting it out on Product Hunt was the last kind of bit of it. But yeah, we can talk about how that how that went down. Yeah, that was that was an interesting experience too. Well, I was going to say you hit number two on Product Hunt, which is definitely a lot better than I did when this podcast got onto Product Hunt. So I have to congratulate you on that. But Thank what you. was your magic trick? Like, did you have a following? For example, on Product Hunt already, or did you manage to just catch a wave on the site, just kind of generate all of that buzz organically on the site, or were there some other tricks and techniques that you used to push yourself up the list? You know, it's funny. Uh, I, I thought about it, and a couple of people asked me about it after I did the launch. So, with Product Hunt, there's a lot of advice out there about when to launch, you know, what day is better for launches, and you know, all that good stuff. I actually thought I bo- had botched uh, the launch because I put it out on a certain date. I scheduled it for, I think, a Sunday. And then uh, it looked like it actually came out earlier than the the scheduled time. So I was really confused. And for a couple of days, I thought, well, it'll probably just vanish and no one will hear about it. And then all of a sudden, you know, emails started popping out, you know, and, um, you know, notifications started coming through. And um, yeah, it turned out it, it hit, you know, number two. And so, you know, that was obviously just one day. So obviously, the, the, these number twos happened literally every day on product time, but it, it does generate good buzz. And and the main takeaway from that was, you know, I obviously try to do as much as possible in terms of the, the visual aspect of it. So, you know, it had all the bells and whistles, like, you know, good visuals and it had a, like a GIF that played uh, when you, as an, a kind of an avatar for it on product time, which attracts attention. But I think the main thing was that it, it just hit the right audience because that's what the audience on product hunt is looking for. You know, these are marketers, uh, indie hackers, growth hackers, and uh, product people, they're looking for things like that, things around UX, things around experimentation. So in a way, it just hit the right audience. And that was probably the main thing uh, that, that came out of it. And, you know, hopefully it was also a good product that, you know, attracted <laughs> attention. And, and the copy must have been good so that people understood what it was about. So all those things contributed probably. So did you see a very pronounced uptick in site usage after that then like what was the scale of that uptick like was it like double 10 times or just sort of more linear type growth definitely yeah um, yeah i think in the 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 total amount that uh, so uh, obviously it, you know it's a long tail but it went up to i think about 3000 visitors per day for a couple of days so that was great and that was uh, in comparison to the normal traffic that is about uh, you know 10 to 20 times higher than I normally experience. So that was definitely noticeable. You know, and there, there's a lot of things that played into it. I was also featured on the the email that goes out to uh, all the product hunt subscribers, obviously. So that that's a lot of it. But up until this day, there's a lot of referrals that still come from product hunt. You'd be surprised because, I mean, it's it must be buried there under you know <laughs> mount, mountains of other products, but uh, somehow people are still finding it. So yeah, but it was definitely a great uptick, and and I was I was lucky, I was I was kind of I wasn't anticipating that, but I thought that if it were to come to this uh, and I would get some traffic out of it, then I made made sure that I prepared myself for when when it does. And so what I did was, you know, before the launch, I set it up so that people who would visit me they would get a pop up to ask me to recruit them for an interview or just to get a bit more context for, from them. And so it was quite successful because I gained uh, about I think easily 10 interviews uh, and you know i ma- made made sure that i could segment by price i gave them an offer so that they could sort of give it, give me the price that they would want to be paid for that interview so it was quite good yeah just being able to kind of like swing a couple of things together at once when you when you're launching these things uh. oh, very cool sounds like a really worthwhile experience but have you had any good feedback from some of the users of the site product hunt or otherwise that have come in started looking around found some frameworks or found some techniques gone off and used them and then come back to you afterwards and said hey that really helped that really made a difference or on the flip side hey that really sucked like either way i'll take i haven't heard anyone sort of complain about uh, the the techniques 
you know, not working. But I think that, you know, there's probably a lot of the silent majority that they probably didn't work for them and they never mentioned it to me. <laughs> as long as I stay silent. As long as I stay silent, yeah. And again, you know, uh, thankfully, I mean, I'm kind of protected in a way that the, the content is not mine. I just provide a link to it. And, uh, you know, you can almost say that, you know, it's the person who created the content is, is wrong. But, you know, as I say, you know, it's not a, really about the content. It's about the actions of the individual who's reading that content and taking it in, you know, because you can mess it up even with the best instructions, you know. So it really does put a lot of work on, obviously, the person who's performing that, that experiment or whatever, trying that technique. I have had feedback from, you know, uh, a couple of studios that have used it for products that their clients bring to them, they want to build them out. And so obviously, in that early stage, a lot of these techniques are super helpful, because, you know, they're they're able to kind of set them up, maybe put some budget towards running some ads, as you know, if some of those techniques involve that, and they find it really helpful, because they don't have to they have a suite of, of techniques that they can try out, but they can also figure out which ones to try based on what they're trying to answer. Uh, are they trying to answer whether someone needs it, whether someone would pay for it, and, you know, things like that. So, yeah. But, uh, I mean, I, I'm always looking for more feedback. And as, as you said, you know, there's a lot of work to do there to make sure that the end-to-end experience with something like that is, is, is complete. It's not just a starting point. Yeah. So there's a lot of work to do, for sure. Oh, keep you busy. But speaking of busy, by day, as we've said, you've been working for zero, but you've also been working in product management for a few years now in, out in New Zealand. That's right. Where you moved from Russia. So I've got two questions on that. First of all, how did you get into product management in the first place? And second of all, how did you end up in New Zealand? Becoming a product manager was not my original plan uh, for my career. <laughs> it so, never is. So, never is. But I came to it through a pretty weird path, I guess, uh, because I was a pricing and yield analyst. So, uh, you know, I was working at a car rental company and there was a lot of machine learning that I was learning and a lot of mathematics and, and things like that. Uh, and I started to realize that I felt like a bit of a fraud. Someone should have told me that I probably would feel, <laughs> probably would feel like a fraud if I went to product management as well. So that nobody warned me about that. But I started to learn about, <laughs> yeah, I started to learn about these product people that were building products here and there. I think that was around the time when the buzz started to kind of come through from perhaps the Silicon Valley. And that's that's what I started to to kind of learn about it and learn about UX as well. I think my connection to it was through the UX and sort of even design um, aspects of that work that product people end up being involved in eventually. So I, I stumbled into it as probably a lot of people stumble into it, but I stumbled into it from a very weird place, which is I mean, I think a lot of people come into it from uh, software engineering or perhaps, you know, project management or, or business analysis. Yeah. I was coming at it from a slightly different place. But part of it is also the product management culture in New Zealand, which we'll hopefully talk about uh, today as well. But we will. That is an unusual culture, I can say. And it's created a lot of weird things that occur in, in, the, in this role in, in New Zealand. Oh, and your other question was about me me ending up in in uh, New Zealand when that was really easy. You know, uh, Russia is definitely not New Zealand uh, in many ways. <laughs> it's uh, much colder. It's a lot grayer. And you know, I thought that New Zealand would be a much better place for me and my family to be. So that was an easy choice. So it wasn't just that you watched Lord of the Rings, looked at all the mountains, and thought that was a cool place to go. <laughs> Or was it a little bit of that as well? Definitely played a part into that too, for sure, for sure. Best tourist video ever, right? Totally. (laughs) (laughs) But you touched on the product culture, and obviously New Zealand is pretty much as far away as you can get from just about anywhere, aside from Australia, as we mentioned before this call. But like, it's very far from Silicon Valley. It's very far from Europe. It's very far from all of the tech hubs that you would normally call tech hubs. So... What is the product management culture in New Zealand and how does it differ? Like, are there many similarities or is it just a very different beast down there? I mean, you know, I'm, I haven't really done a, a full anthropological study of how <laughs> we, we came to have this culture here. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that it's a bad culture or something's wrong with it, but it's definitely different to what we read about in uh, most of the product management books, things that come out of the Silicon Valley. And I, I think primarily my, my hypothesis is that primarily this is because, you know, in the Silicon Valley, there's a lot of engineering and, and uh, even probably these days also design-led organizations that understand 
product. Obviously, there's a lot of knowledge and experience built up in that that world that is brought over from even just you know people talking to people in in casual conversations. Whereas in New Zealand, we never really had a strong software first, engineering first culture uh, in general. You know, it's, it's a lot of uh, sales and marketing driven organizations that then think, oh well, this this product thing is is a is definitely a thing. So we need to bring on some product people into our organization, but all the decisions, everything that's happening are still is still very much sales driven. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of that old school thinking that, that still occurs. And obviously a lot of people convert from roles that are not originally product roles. Um you know nobody studies product in, in general, obviously. <laughs> but a lot of people come from, you know, project management and, and business analysis. Those roles are amazing and you know there's a lot of depth of knowledge that is required for those roles. But there's a difference why we talk about you know the difference between project management and product management because there there's a lot of things that seem like they're almost the same but they're actually completely different in many ways and that is a yeah but th- that difference is hard to understand if you you know if you haven't really felt one or the other properly so yeah i think that that's the main distinction i guess for for uh, product culture in new zealand it's exciting because it's becoming better and better and we're we're learning a lot of great things there's a lot of teams that are now closer to the right ways to do product for lack of a better term you know <laughs> there's there's a lot of cohort courses popping up that that are you know teaching the right approaches but yeah still a long way to go yeah and just to back that up there's a lot of that thinking i think in europe as well for example and probably in most other parts of the world i think you know i've spoken to other people for the podcast and other people in the community that work in other places, uh, live in other places, places like you know, in Canada or in, in Germany or you know, London myself. And I think that you've hit the nail on the head to some extent. You've got a lot of people starting companies that are coming from either other companies like what you've just described, or they're coming from maybe big corporates or enterprises that they've worked in before. They've had a fantastic idea and all credit to them for that, but they don't actually know how to, again, quote unquote, properly build it. Now, I'm a big fan of adapting these books to the reality that you're in, rather than just trying to get, you know, it's really easy to get disappointed about, well, hang on, I read Escape in a Build Trap, and it said this, and that's not what we're doing. So I'm going to throw my toys in the air and and run. Like, (laughs) some people, I think, get stuck in that mindset, because it's, these books are so foundational to the way that product managers are supposed to think. And it's really tough, as you say, when you're working in a place or in, in a company that, that doesn't get it the way you do. But I think, and this is something that I've been discussing recently on Twitter, is you can't just wave the book at people because it doesn't work. No, you're absolutely right. And, and I really appreciate that you're putting it out there because you know, this This is, uh, I think, a message that a lot of people need to hear is that, you know, life goes on, you know, it doesn't really matter what the books say, you know, you have a job to do. And part of the thing that a product role, uh, I think, is is the toughest for people to figure out is that depending on which team or which product you're working on, you'll be required to do different things, but all with the goal of trying to make it as, as successful as possible. That's a given, right? And And sometimes that means that you will be doing some things that you read in the books and the books say, don't do that. But you know that you need to do it because that's what is missing. Uh, I think I put out a meme around the time of like two Spider-Men pointing at each other and saying, don't be a, <laughs> don't be a project manager, but you have to also be, you know, do everything to make the product successful. Sometimes you have to do, uh, you know, the things that you don't want to do. And, you know, the books may not always get it right. So yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, but I guess a follow on question from that would be has there or have there been any situations in your career working in that product culture that you've just described where you've been, for example, working with a really pushy VP of sales or a founder's been telling you to do a load of things that you weren't really sure you wanted to do and that you've actually managed to change their mind either via putting the book in front of them and somehow they read it or by just managing to persuade them? using some data or using some argument that actually managed to shake them? Like, have, has that been something that you've managed to find some techniques that really work? Yeah, I think I've been successful most of the times when, when that happens, you know, especially in the beginning when people listen to you just by virtue of kind of you providing a different lens to things. 
certainly I've tried to give books, but books are unfortunately not scalable. People don't read them as fast <laughs> as they need to. So I've stopped doing that because unfortunately that doesn't work very well. But coming from the data analyst background, you know, it's really easy for me to to jump into that world and really gather some support for or maybe not find some support for the ideas that have been proposed. And several times, you know, we, we come back to the the 404 test, you know, it's a it's a classic uh, example where a test like that can help put a bit of nuance to the idea that someone is pushing for where they want to get it all the way across the line, you know, in the, the final perfect state. And you just suggest to kind of run this first experiment as a way to kind of validate whether there is what, what kind of not so much whether there is demand or not, but what level of demand is there for something like that? Because it's usually not a black and white type situation where people say, no, I hate it, don't do it. Yeah. It's usually just a me- measure of what, what lens you want to apply to this. Is it is it a million dollar thing or is it a thousand dollar thing? And that's been super helpful because these th- this tests are really e- quick to set up and they give you quick answers really, really fast. So yeah, for sure. But you know, it's a never ending fight. You know, there's, there's always uh, <laughs> more, more arguments to, um, to consider and, and not all of them you have to win. Sometimes people are right to build what they want to build and, you know, of course, that's the joy of the, the profession. You have to figure it out. <laughs> well, the struggle continues. For sure. But speaking of struggles, what's next for product management world? Do you have any exciting new plans or features? I mean, you've mentioned a roadmap earlier, but like, is there anything coming soon? Yeah, for sure. Well, at the moment, like I mentioned, you know, I'm trying to figure out how much value it has created and how much value can I extract out of it by virtue of, uh, you know, putting some uh, a paywall behind it, which you know, uh, it sounds like a terrible thing to be doing. You know, if it was <laughs> free originally, now it's a paid product. You got to eat, right? Yeah, and and you know, and I, I do this also as a you know an accountability exercise for myself. You know, because it's so easy for me to pat myself on the back and say, yeah, product hunt number uh, two, product uh, you know this day <laughs> or that day. But is someone willing to pay for it? You know, that's the ultimate question that you want to answer. And so, based on how that goes, you know, there's a couple of pathways that I want to take but you know community is definitely part of it and restructuring it to make sure that i can do more things uh you know we talked about you know this whole end-to-end experience with some of these experiments you know building that out it will require some time and some resource but you know i'm exciting to build it out but i, I think there's more to it i'm thinking of it as more of a you know uh, as, a, as a brand that that is surrounded by different products that that are you know sort of semi-detached to the to the world of product management but not necessarily going down you know, developing the roadmap for one thing, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that this world is fractured in general. So, you know, there's a lot of gaps to fill with different small products. And that's, that's my approach in general. There you go, go for the portfolio approach straight away. And where can people find you after this, if they want to chat more about products or find out more about product management world or anything else that they've heard about today? Definitely. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm always on Twitter, as you know, we're, we're often chatting there. And LinkedIn is also my second place where I'm hanging out uh, quite a bit. So those are the main ones. And, you know, my, my last name dot com uh, is my, my website. If people want to check, check it out, I've got a Substack newsletter where I write sporadically about all these experiments. So, you know, but I have a pretty unique last name. So anyone who types it into the browser will be able to find me. That's for sure. Yeah, well, you're living the dream of all the standard touch points. So that should be easy for people to find. But I'll make sure we link that into the show notes as well. Thank you. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. So obviously really appreciate hearing some of the story of Product Management World and some of your thoughts and experiences and thinking about how things could be done differently. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Hopefully we can stay in touch. But as for now, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com check out some of my other fantastic guests sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure you share it with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again i'll be back soon with another inspiring guest but as for now thanks and good night